Hello and welcome to Hannibal TV. I am JP John Paz from the Two Man Power Trip of Wrestling. And of course, Mr. Devin Nicholson, a.k.a. Hannibal, is with us. And the reason we're here, the star of this show, the one and only man that found John Cena. He found the Ultimate Warrior. He found Sting. He is Mr. Rick Bastman. What's going on, Rick? What's going on, Hannibal? Guys, how you doing? We're doing great. The, uh... You forgot to terrible, mention that Rick the terrible the top heel. is back. Rick is I'm also good, the man. top heel on the Hannibal TV. Yes. <laughs> you know, am days. I really that? What, what I a, think you're what the most the hated guy. Is. You're my most hated is, guest of the past month. <laughs> wow. Wow. I, I mean, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. Um, <laughs> it is what it is, right? I guess we got a lot of Ultimate no, that, Warrior that, and Paul Orndorff fans. That's what it is. So I actually got more hate over the Warrior War than the Cornette War. That's pretty shocking, man. People are on your side overall for the Cornette thing, I think, on this channel. We don't yeah, have Yeah, but not on Warrior. That's... All right. That's interesting. No, a, well, we have you have a lot of Warrior fans. Yeah, yeah, it's all good, man. You know, I got a um I got a email and then a phone call last week from a very very sharp guy who's a pretty accredited producer and they're doing a special uh, on A&E, fully budgeted on the Ultimate Warrior and the guy gave me the big pitch about being part of it cuz they're going to do the first truly balanced look at the person Jim Helwig and then, uh, you know, the person, the warrior became, because that was his legal name. And, you know, I really liked this guy. He had his ducks in a row. It sounded like the show that really should be done. And I passed on it, man. Even though I was offered uh, a fee to participate, I passed on it because for the same reason I wanted to do this tonight, I just kind of had enough about, um, you know, this business, this world where we're, we're so... Um, I don't know, inclined, but so encouraged to talk shit about people. And uh, I, I haven't liked doing that for a long time now. I'll do it on occasion if there's like a show for it or a reason or it might be fun. But I think I'm just kind of over it all in all. So thanks for doing it. Thanks for agreeing to do this, you guys. And we're actually going to talk nicely about people. What a, what a nice change for this world and for this industry in particular. And you also have some secret projects you're working on that you can't talk about that you might be uh, getting some financial uh, large success on too. So that's probably another reason you passed. Oh, um, another reason what, Devin? I'm sorry. Hey, my, like, uh, didn't you uh, you tell me that there's some some big stuff you're cooking up behind the scenes? in some other things mm -hmm. that uh, that you're pretty busy with. So that's probably another reason why you passed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, I mean, I am doing, we got some really cool things in the work that I'm really proud of personally. Yeah. It, it's awesome. Um, and it's not like it's even that special to be top secret. It just has to be kept quiet for certain reasons. It's not that interesting. Um, but no, you know, I passed, and I appreciate you saying that and putting me over in that regard. But really, truly, I passed because when he brought it up to me on the phone, as much as I appreciated his support, I just had this feeling inside of me where like, it's kind of like mommy would tell you, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say it, right? I'm like, I just didn't, this feeling, I just didn't want to do it, man. So there you go. That's the main reason. Very good. Well, John, what is uh, Rick going to talk about today? The, the good people in wrestling and MMA. You can elaborate on this topic, John. Yeah, so Rick basically said to me he wanted to do something more positive. He wants to talk about the good people in wrestling and MMA and not focus on the negative like we kind of did with Paul Orndorff, and we did a little bit with the Ultimate Warrior as well. So I guess, obviously, Warrior is not going to make this list of the, of the top good guys in wrestling and MMA. But Rick, kind of just start us off. Where do you kind of think you want to head, and, and who do you want to talk about first as far as being a good guy in pro wrestling or a good guy in MMA? Yeah, you know, I think it's going to be a little random. I, I don't have a format in mind for this, but I think it'll, it'll take shape as it goes. Um, you know, what one guy can mention right away, 
one of my and, and I, I actually had to think long and hard about because we talked about 15 guys. I don't know if we even get through the whole list or not, but I had to think long and hard about who would be in that top 15. One of the guys when I you know I wrote my book years ago, Little Big Man, still not out. One of these years I'll get it out. In it, there was a section, emphasis on was, called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly of Pro Wrestling and Mixed Martial Arts. And I kind of went through the good guys in detail. Then I went through the bad guys. And my friend said to me, he goes, you know what, man? He goes, you don't need to do this. He goes, you've had enough of a good life and enough good stories out there that you just don't need to go there on, uh, you know, on certain people. Nothing else for business reasons. And uh, I said, yeah, but it makes the book interesting. And I was sure I'd won that argument. And then years later, probably two, three years ago now, I took that part out of the book. So that whole list of bad is, is gone. And the person that encouraged me to remove it was Diamond Dallas Page, who has been a close friend for many, many years now and is you know, always such a positive guy who is always ready to speak the best of everybody, to encourage everybody. I mean, all that stuff you see in DDPY, uh, DDP yoga, which has been a huge success, which I'm very happy uh, for him about. Dude, it's all real. That That's the essence of the guy. He's just a good, solid, stand-up, positive guy who uh, wants the best for everyone around him. And he's done pretty damn well for himself, too, and he deserves it. So that would be a guy who would positively make the list. And Mick Foley has a very funny line about DDP. Yes, he would want to help out, you know, Scott Hall and Jake and all these wrestling legends. But no, he would never want them to live in his house and he'd have to feed them. So that just shows you how nice DDP is. He goes the extra mile. He feeds them. He lets them live with them. I mean, he goes the extra mile yeah. for his friends. Yeah, the uh, the the crib, he called it. Um, the house. Yeah, I've spent time in that house before. A matter of fact, last time I spent time there, uh, Jake and Scott were both there at the time. And it's like they had absolutely moved in. And, dude, he was just cool about it. I mean, it was like dysfunction house on steroids. And he's just cool about it. So, yeah, you, you got to love that about him. It's really cool. Nikki said, hey, Batsman, love your channel. I am a fan of blues also. I think she's talking about funky blues. Oh, that's right. Little thing we do here on Maui each, uh, each week, uh, live blues. Something for us uh, old burnout hippies to do every Saturday night. It's awesome. See, look, Hannibal, Nikki likes my show. She doesn't hate me. There's one. <laughs> there you go. We get one more <laughs> from the show. Dennis. Dennis does too. Right. They're from your channel, though. They watch on your channel, which is youtube.com slash Rick Bassman, which we can remind people uh, oh, yeah. to check out now. I know uh, I haven't checked his subscribers for a while, but it's definitely on the upswing. And this video is also streaming live on his channel. And there's some custom content on there that people should check out. Dennis Thank you, said, man. Appreciate that. Yeah. The man was trying to come great. up with some interest. I miss live music. Dennis loves you, too. That's fantastic. I don't know what band he's talking Oh, the band on the live Funky Blues deal. That's really cool, man. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. I'll let them know you said so. They'll, uh, they'll appreciate that. And... Um, Okay, when you talk about, okay, John Pagliacci, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, when you talk about good guys in wrestling, I think you have to mention Ricky Steamboat. Nice guy and well-spoken. Okay, so I cannot dispute that, certainly. And the only reason I can't agree right on hand is I honestly, John, both Johns, John Paz and John Pagliacci, I don't really know Ricky. Um, I've met him a couple of times. I've talked to him on the phone a couple of times. Matter of fact, I put him on the Cameo app not long ago. So we spoke about that. And yeah, he seems like a very nice guy. I've heard good things about him. I've never heard of anything bad about him. And you can't say it about many people in this business. Um, so I'm sure R Ricky the Dragon would be in many people's top 15, just not mine, because I don't know him that well. That's all. That would be my um, that would be my response to that. A couple of guys like in my top, one guy controversial maybe to some people, and I believe he's a mutual friend of all of ours, is uh, Mike Bucci, a.k.a. Simon Dean, a.k.a. O, AKA Nova. Um, I say controversial only because he was in talent relations. And, you know, when you're a executive in talent relations, no matter how good you are, you're going to take heat. It comes with 
the territory. It's like being a wrestling promoter or agent. No matter what side of the street you walk on, you're always going to take shit. Um, you know, I love Nova. Mike Bucci, Simon Dean, truly one of the best best guys in this business and that I know in life as well. And John, you're friends with Nova, are you? I know him fairly well. Yeah, he's, he's a super nice guy. I had a really, really long interview with him a few years back, he, which was very uh, great to get him. And then we actually used him on a show that we booked him on. So I know him you know, fairly well. I'm, um, we'll just say he's such a nice guy and very kind of humble, but also funny and sarcastic as well. So cool. Yeah. Guy. Yeah. All that stuff. He's very, he's very real for sure. You know, there's wrestling is an interesting business. We all know the three of us, especially that the entire business or the success of somebody in the business is based on their ability to fool the public or as we say to work somebody. And now when I say work, that, that can have a bad connotation. I don't mean work somebody or get over on somebody. I mean, create an illusion that you get people to buy into. That's how you succeed as a pro wrestler, right? So, so many guys, when they're in public, when they're doing media, that they have those working shoes on. And I, you know, I've been doing this long enough now that I think I can see the difference when somebody, somebody is working, being nice, and someone is genuine. And the list I put together here for tonight are people that are friends of mine that I know to be genuine and know to be real and not not able only to turn it on for media or for whatever the case may be. So I, I wanted to, to draw that distinction. Number one is going to be Tank Abbott, right? You know what? Tank is, believe it or not, in my top 15 guys. Um, were you being sarcastic about that or not? I uh, just tell. for the fans out there might be surprised at that. I, w I would also consider him a nice guy and not – not a worker from the point that, as we all know, all three of us, some wrestlers are constantly trying to work you. Uh, he seems like a, a nice guy for sure, even though he's outspoken. Dude, Tank, Tank is the anti-worker, man. <laughs> that guy doesn't work anybody about anything. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about Tank. Um, yeah, I may have told you this before or not. I'm not sure. But it's one of my favorite of many Tank Abbott stories. It's after I had booked him to fight Yoshida at Pride. And Tank is, and I think I've said this before, the only guy that did not let me collect commissions then deduct, or did collect the money, deduct my commission and pay him. He always wanted the money to go right to him. And that was fine. I mean, he was always good about paying me my, um, and I, you just put up a good guy number one. I don't have rankings or order, by no, the way. No, but I'm just going to uh, put the number to each one because you said 15. Cool. That's great. Um, so Tank comes back from Japan, calls me. He goes, hey, they said they'll wire me the uh, the money in a few days. I'll let you know when it's in. I'll get to your commission. I said, great. The very next day, I get a call from him going, hey, you won't believe this. It showed up already. Let's meet up so I can get you your money. I mean, that's pretty upstanding, right? So I said, great. I'll drive, you know, I'll drive to see you. He's in Huntington Beach. I'm in San Clemente. You know, it's an hour round trip. I was doing very well financially in those days, but it was like 11 grand cash. So that was worth the trip in my mind. So he goes, no, man, don't worry about it. We're going to the wild animal park. We're going right by you. I'll drop it off to you. I'm like, this is even better. He's calling me days before I expected it, telling me the money is in, and he's going to hand deliver it to me. Doesn't get much better than that. So a couple hours goes by and no tank. Um, another thing about Tank, he's always on time. Man, if he tells you he's going to be somewhere at 4 p.m., he's there at 4 on the nose, if not a little bit early. So a couple hours goes by, no Tank. I call him, and he is just freaking hammered, which is not a surprise for Tank. Most of my Tank stories, if not all of them, involve alcohol. So he answers the phone. He's hammered. I'm like, Dave, he's all oh, man. We got in the car. We started drinking. We got drunk. We drove right past you, man. I'm sorry. And I'm like, oh, shoot. He goes, well, you can come join us at the Wild Animal Park if you want. Now, that's like an hour in the other direction for me. I'm like, Dave, I go, dude, what if I drive all the way there and you're too drunk to answer the phone? Don't worry. We'll get it. So I get in my car. I drive. I call him. One of his cronies answers the phone, drunker than Tank. He's like, yeah, meet me out front. Walk up out front. The guy, Eddie Reese, is holding a ticket for me. I go in, Tank and all his guys, his bike, big biker buddies, they're in one of the pavilions, and they have these big, giant cups 
with rubber animal heads on top of it. They're drinking out of them. And Tank's like, Rick, hey, man, you want your money? I'm like, yeah. He goes, great. He goes, drink this first. He puts his cup down. I swear it's this big. It's like a giant 7-Eleven size cup. And it, it's his trademark vodka and cranberry. But there's like that much cranberry. It's basically straight vodka. I go, so I drink that to get the money. He's like, yep. So I drank it. Took a while. He takes the top off, examines it. He goes, great. You drank it. I said, cool, man. He goes, here's your money. Reaches the pocket, hands me 11 grand cash. I'm like, thanks, Dave. That's awesome. How am I supposed to drive home now? He's like, that's why I bought you the ticket to get in. So I ended up hanging around Tank and cronies all day, tripping around the wild animal park. But that's a pretty typical Tank story. You know, he's out there, but super, super good dude. Sean Wood said, how was Tank professionally? Professionally, Tank was the height of professional. He did what he said he was going to do and never anything less than that. Absolutely, 100%. A man of his word, no doubt about it. Is it common for him to like hang out at wild animal parks without kids or anything and just yeah, go yeah. There he's like a giant. Him? He's like a giant kid in that regard. He likes to go do fun things. Dude, I don't know about you. I love going to amusement parks. Probably my favorite um, vacation as an adult was go. I think I, John, you and I talked about this once. Was going to Disney World with my mm -hmm. wife at the time. So I, I understand why he's into that sort of thing. Sure. Absolutely. As far as Tank, I think the you know the general consensus would be like he's nuts, he's crazy. You know he'll yep. knock you, he'll knock you out like stuff like that. But no, he's actually to his friends. I guess he's he's cool and, and he's very collected, and you know he's not going to beat you up or anything like that. No, no, he beat up he'll beat up other people. Not anymore, but that was his mode for a long time. I didn't really appreciate that part of him, but uh, is what was what it was. You know, you know. Speaking of. Fights though in bars, he would uh, would cause his own fights with people in bars. He did admit that to me. Abs absolutely. Um, you know, another guy that people would say is crazy that loved to get into bar fights, who was also on my list, is Sean O'Hare. And you know, unfortunately, three of the people that I wrote down for my list are are no longer with us, and Sean was one of them. He um he uh, married um a girl named Joy Elizabeth Brown. And that was the sister of Heather Brown, who was Tom Howard's wife. And Tom is, you know, if I had to rank guy number one on my list, it probably would be Tom. He's my, he's my best friend in the pro wrestling business and one of my best friends in life, period. So Tom and Sean O'Hare ended up being brothers-in-law of all things. And Tom and I owned a gym together in uh, San Clemente at the time. Sean had been released from... John, you'd have to help me. Probably WCW, I think it was. And we convinced him to move out and join us. So it's me and Tom and Sean O'Hare and Evan Marriott, Joe Millionaire, who's about, you know, 6'5", 270, in shape at that point. Uh, Stefan Gamlin, who won the, uh, you know, the team tough man against the NFL, big 6'7", 330-pounder, also signed to WWE. And uh, Matt Tyler, Apocalypse, who's about 6'10", 400. And that was our hangout group in San Clemente, this tiny little town. I, I had lived in San Clemente for probably 12 years at that point. I had never gotten into a single fight in San Clemente. Sean was there for about half a year and got in a fight a month regularly in the small bars in San Clemente. <laughs> like, Sean, how is that even possible, man? And he's like, I don't know, Rick. He goes, people just pick on me. You know what Sean O'Hare was all about. Who's going to pick on Sean, right? Um, but he was a little twisted for sure. But, man, truly some of the greatest qualities in a person I, I ever met in this industry or any other. And uh, he, he's a guy that, too, you know, for me at least, will, will absolutely always uh, be missed. I'll get back to O'Hare in a second, but Sean has a question. I wonder if Rick had any dealings with Vader, R.I.P. Vader. Yeah, Sean, I, I barely knew Vader, Leon. Um, I've met him a couple of times. When I was living in Colorado many, many years ago, I was living in Denver. Leon lived in Boulder. He was promoting a show at uh, Colorado University where the Buffaloes play, and he booked me to be on his show, which I thought was pretty nice. And I worked. Um, 
a match where I managed uh, Dr. Death. I'm sorry, screwed that up. I got to manage Vader against Dr. Death on the show. And they kind of ribbed me a little bit because uh, Steve, Dr. Death, kept coming after me and Vader was supposed to get me out of trouble, but he would just kind of hang back. And uh, it was a pretty terrifying experience. It, I learned later it was a rib. It was a small show, spot show, not TV, so we were all goofing around. And uh, he was fun to work with that one time. He was always pleasant when I saw him, but I can't say that we were, you know, friends by definition of the word. And as far as Sean O'Hare, uh, I was talking, obviously, uh, your good friend, uh, Joe Millionaire of Marriott, he was saying that he had a lot of backstage problems with wrestling because, you know, mentally, maybe he was kind of helter-skelter and he was kind of all over the place. Did you see that a lot? Like when he was actually wrestling backstage, did he get in a lot of fights and have a lot of problems? Never at UPW or Valor Fighting, which were my wrestling brand and my MMA brand, that he participated in both. And he was always a ton of fun to be around and really, really nice to everybody. So never had any – I heard the same stories, John. I'm not disputing what you're saying at all. Um, but never had any trouble with him in our, our environment. I think that Sean had so much pressure on him because right – from the very beginning, people thought he was going to be you know, a major, major superstar. And I think the pressure got the better of him You know, when he was at K1, fighting the top guys in the world, when he was at WWE, wrestling the top guys in the world. I think when he was at UPW and Valor, in my companies, he just got to relax and be himself and have fun. So he was truly one of the nicest, funnest guys to be around at that point in time. One of those guys, he had so much potential. You know, you saw star power written all over him, and it just didn't work out for him for whatever reason. Maybe yeah. he got into some backstage arguments or whatever, but he seemed like he was one of those five-tool players. He had all the tools, just didn't kind of uh, you know amount to what he should have. It's not his fault, though, and I've come across this in my interviews. It's actually the whole Piper and Hogan thing. Yep, Hogan had his day dispute and left during that angle, and then Piper quit. Or no, Piper was fired over some remarks he made on HBO sports yep. show. And at the time yep. Sean was being pushed with Piper. So that was pretty much the end of his big push. Yeah. Which was a shame. I, it was, it was a pretty big thrill for me when they paired those two guys up because, you know, I think John, you know, this Devin, you might the another guy that absolutely be on the top of my top list would be Roddy Piper. And, you know, after, um, after Tom Howard, and, you know, I, I don't want to rank people, like I said, but I have to probably after Tom and before a couple others on the list, Roddy was my closest friend in the business for by far for many, many years. Um, I came up as a big fan of his. I was absolutely a rowdy Roddy Piper mark. I love to show this on our shows. You know that it's the only action figure I have ever owned in my entire life. I still have it. Um I almost named my new dog after him. And I even got Roddy's daughter's permission or blessing to do that. Um, but uh, man, Roddy, there was, there was nobody, there was nobody like him, man. Um, we know, we all know the public persona. Uh, and that was, you know, that was him just turned up. I and mean, he was a really complex guy, really interesting, would quite literally give you the shirt off his back and, and I know the definition of the word literally, it's misused always. He would do that. He needed a shirt, he'd give you a shirt. Um, man, I just can't say enough uh, good stuff about about Roddy Piper. And like uh, like Sean O'Hare, man, he is, uh, he is badly missed. That's for sure. And in Roddy's case, by millions, of course. It's an amazing, amazing guy. And the thing with Piper, which is crazy, is if you meet him as a fan, like I did, you figure like, okay, he's one of the biggest stars of all time. He's probably going to rush you through the line or he's going to be quick. No, it's the exact opposite. He spent like five minutes at least with every person. Yeah. So, I mean, there, and yeah. the line was long as hell. He didn't care how long he had to stay there. I'm sure he was supposed to be there two hours. He was probably there for four. But he was yeah. so nice to everybody and joking around and yeah, you know, he put my brother in a sleeper hold. I was hoping he was going to cinch it in, you know, but uh, really, really <laughs> nice guy. Right. Such a cool guy. Sean and what you're, what, what you're describing was not the exception to the rule. He was like that day in and day out, every single appearance, every event he ever went to. I was, you know, he and I were with each other enough times that I saw it over and over and over again. And 
you know, you could say that he he was that way out of a sense of duty because he's a professional. So maybe that's part of it. But I can say the lion's share of it is he truly wanted everybody around him to be happy and feel like they had a good experience when they met him. That's just who the guy was. Sean Wood said, I love the Lord Alfred Hayes, Roddy Piper story, LMAO classic. All right, JP, you'd have to help us out or help me out on that one because I don't know it. I'm not even sure what he's referring to unless he's talking about how uh, Lord Alfred Hayes had a big, you know, big Johnson, if you will. I'm not sure if he's referring to that. Uh, that yeah, or it's not. sexual harassment type uh, story regarding Alfred sexually harassing, allegedly, Roddy when he was younger. But we won't get into that because we have 15 to go through. And yes. We're we at number yes. three. So who's going to no, be? We've done like. We've done like five or six so far. No, nope, actually, oh, we're at four. No, nope, we got. Uh, hold on, I I got six. I got DDP. I yep. got Nova. I got no, Tank. Okay, I'll add them. Yep. yep. I got Tank. I got O'Hare. I got Tom Howard, and I got Piper. So technically, we got six. You know, JP, you got to think Hannibal, as smart as he is, and as on top of as he is counting his. 200,000 plus followers and keeping a really specific tab of the growth every day yep. would know the difference between four and six, but <laughs> what do I know? Well, you didn't it's go into right. those guys in that much detail. And maybe I don't really like Nova, to be honest with you. He never gave me any tryouts. I was almost signed through Dreamer and then Ty Bailey got me signed. Nova was always a dick to me. So maybe I just blocked sure. him. You guys were saying he was nice, but I had a different... Uh, Rick was not a wrestler, and, and John only dealt with him as an interviewer. As an interviewer, when I interviewed him, he was cool with me uh, from that perspective. But as yeah. Rick says, anyone in a position of power for talent, you're going to have heat for various reasons. With and some people. Yeah. Yep. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. And and that's not surprising to hear. We have we all have different experiences with different people, you know, for, for sure. No, no doubt about it. Like a, a guy that's on my list that a lot of people go, he's, well, they say one thing or another is, is Paul London. Uh, ha, have you guys had much experience with Paul? I yes. have. I've interviewed him before. He is nuts, but in a good way. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Right. Um, yeah. And you hear that about him all the time. He's nuts. Uh, Paul, He's truly one of my favorite human beings on this planet, um, not just in the in the pro wrestling business. He's just a good dude. And, you know, it started for us back at the height of UPW. And that's when we were signing one guy after another out, out of the crew. That's when, you know, I had my eye, out, my eye out for big guys. You know, I've always been called like a big guy, Mark. But that's what the industry was looking for at that time. And Paul was at Shawn Michaels School in Florida or sorry, Texas, and the school closed down. So like uh, like Brian Kendrick had not long before, Paul relocated himself on his dime to California to come to UPW. And man, I, I feel really bad about this still to this day. I completely 100% ignored that guy. Um, it's just I had my eye on other things. I wasn't mean to him. I I would say I wasn't dismissive. Maybe I was dismissive. And I, I think about, and he's so nice to me and still is, and we're real, real friends these days. Um, if I had like a gig come up now, Paul would be one of the very first people, if not the first person I'd call, because I'll perpetually feel like I want to make things up to him. Um, there are a lot of people that, in my opinion, I did a lot for. I did a lot for that turned around and kind of like stabbed me in the back. Paul is the opposite. I did nothing for that guy and he was nothing but good and gracious and nice always to me and with me. So Paul London will always be uh, on my favorites list for sure. And when I was getting WWE extra jobs where oftentimes the wrestlers will just not treat you very well, Paul was very, very nice to me. Every time I was back there, he probably wouldn't even remember me now, but I remembered him just, you know, making you feel comfortable and sure. treating you like one of the boys, even though you're not really one of the boys. No, that 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 sounds like Paul for sure. And uh, JP, have you, you said you have had, well, you said you interviewed him and he was great, but he was a little nutty, right? 
Yeah, but in, in like a good way, it's like a funny way. You could just tell, like, okay, this guy is a little bit spacey or a little bit in outer space, but in a fun way, like very jokey, very cool. He'll give you stories that you you know you might not expect him to give you. So he was very very cool. I want to hear his Mordecai story with that guy from uh, what's it called? Uh, the guy that was released from NWA for the controversies. Dave Lagana. Yeah, you yeah. might know that. Yes, but I Paul do know. Ludden is the one that's been saying it. So yep. maybe one day Rick will hook me up with Paul Ludden and I could get it on tape. But yes, I and I and, glad and I know sure. Mordecai. Ahead, John, yeah. sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I know Mordecai pretty well too, and I know that story. And for whatever reason, Paul London <laughs> knows it very, very well. But uh, crazy story because it's like Lagana, you know, little guy, Mordecai, gi giant, and this guy is messing with this guy. It's it's a crazy story for sure, but maybe those guys should. Could, Does should Mordecai remember. tell the story? Yes, to me he did. Yes. Oh God, you got. I'm not going to digress from Rick's podcast, but I really want to get that story on tape. Oh, it's a good one. And he's no longer in the NWA, Rick. Don't worry, it's not a conflict of interest to bring that up. Oh, dear, you know, dear, you know, I don't worry about stuff like that, Hannibal. It's all right, man. It's all good. It's all good. He went um, the way they, they put him out to pasture like they did your buddy Cornette. <laughs> John 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 pauses buddy Cornette. Yes, of course. Well, and then there's the next person on my favorite list, Jim Cornette. No, it's all right. We'll we'll keep going. Um he's on mine. Who knows? He's on mine. You know what? You never know what's gonna happen. When when I was when I was making list list earlier today, I wrote down a short insert list of people that my relationship did not start off on a good foot and who I really like now. So John, who knows? There, there's, there's always hope. Um, maybe one day Jim and uh, maybe one day John Paz will get in the middle and uh, bury the Cornette uh, Bassman hatchet and me and Jim will be buddies. I'd be op I'm open to being friends with anybody, man. Well, I would never say that. I would actually tape my fists up and beat him to death if I could do it legally because I despise <laughs> him and I think he's a total scumbag that like promotes discrimination. So yeah. I feel the opposite. But Rick, you're a great guy, a lot nicer than I am. Fair, fair, fair enough. A lot of your listeners won't believe that, but thank you. I appreciate that. Um, hey, here's a very, this is not to get into discussing any of these guys, but here's a very quick insert list of guys who my relationship was not good with that have absolutely turned around, and I'm glad it's turned around. RVD is one. Um, Brian Kendrick, Spanky, another. Uh, Kevin Quinn, if you know him, he was the head instructor at UPW for a while. Really glad that our relationship turned around. Um, Brian Nobbs, we're not good at one point. He and I are definitely buddies now, and that's awesome. And By then, the way, uh, Brian Nobbs has gained like 60 or 70 pounds in recent months. I saw a picture. Oh, he doesn't have the room for that extra weight either. Wow, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm going to call him and shame him into dieting. There you go. Um, and then, you know, also a guy, Devin, you mentioned, you said he had put me over recently was Charlie Haas. And Charlie and I had a very weird start only because I had never met him. And he and his brother, Russ, and you know, Russ passed away, of course. They were under development. They were part of Kevin Kelly's territory when I had my UPW territory. And we met backstage at one at, at a arena event. And I finally, you know, they were being weird to me, the, uh, the Haas brothers. So I go up to them and I'm like, Hey guys, I go, is everything cool? They're like, um, why they go, why have you been burying us? And I'm like, what? I mean, I don't even really know who they were. I didn't know who they were, but I certainly had nothing to say about them to anybody. Oh yeah. Kevin Kelly has been telling us you've been burying us. I said, interesting. I go, I'm going to, you guys don't know me from Adam, but I'm going to look you guys in the eye right now and tell you, I've never said anything about you to anybody positive or negative. And that turned everything on a dime and it's been super cool with Charlie ever since. So it's, it's, and now Devin tells me he was putting me over in an interview. So that's great. Yeah. Uh, that that's interview is actually up. I posted it today and I will post the clip of him talking about Rick on Rick's youtube.com slash Rick Bassman channel sometime in the coming days. He's been through, I guess he broke the news on my podcast that he's divorced. That only, I guess, went public 
when I put that out, according to. I, I knew the, that they, I knew Charlie and Jackie were separated. I knew that. I did not know they were finalized for divorce still. Looks totally different now, but great guy. And uh, yeah. I personally, there's some people you wouldn't want to fight. He looks like he'll, he'll fight you with every last breath. Um, he has, if you uh, mess with him. Oh, and he's a real deal. Also, he's also he's also a shooter, shooter, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Not. I'm right there with you, Hannibal. Not a guy I'd want to tangle with either. That's for sure. And by the way, Kevin Kelly, he is a little bit of a ribber. I can guess he might have been ribbing those guys. <laughs> oh, thoughts on Sullivan? Is that is that Kevin Sullivan? Do you expect? It must be if it's on this channel with all the Kevin yeah. Sullivan footage we put on. All right, so John Paws will tell you that for months now, I think I've been saying, if you think of it, tell Kevin I said hello. So I haven't talked to Kevin in probably 20 years, I would say. It's been that long. But back when I worked for the Walt Disney Company in the early 90s, it was in Orlando, Kevin and Nancy, who they uh, became the, you know, Chris Benoit's wife, of course, um, lived uh, close by in Daytona Beach. And I don't recall how we connected. But Kevin and Nancy would come out fairly frequently, and they once brought Ashley Flair with them, of all things, when she was a little girl or somewhat young girl. And Kevin and Nancy and I would go out to dinner, and we did that fairly frequently, and we just developed a really nice, friendly relationship. Um, I can't say that we're friends. I don't mean the opposite. We're certainly you know, not unfriendly. We just haven't talked in a long, long time, but I've got nothing but positive stuff to uh, – say about the taskmaster that's for sure now who else is on this list who's number eight like quinn and kendrick rvd and haas and knobs not on the technical nice guy list so who's on the yeah list? That was a, well, okay butterbean butterbean absolutely one of my favorite human beings on this earth has been for so many years now man bean and i have been together to japan to england to Romania, to Guyana, and uh, God knows where, South America, uh, to Canada, um, to so many different places, and and a few times to Alabama, Jasper, Alabama, where he lives. I've been to his home, um, friends with his wife, Libby, got to eat a few times at Butterbean's Barbecue. I don't think it's open any longer because of uh, COVID. Um, Butterbean was at my house. I have a photo of Butterbean with my dog, uh, Ramon and Marley. And uh, we go back a long way. Uh, we're very close personal friends. Uh, Eric Esch, the real name Butterbean, is absolute salt of the earth. So there's another one. He uh, seems to remember him yeah. on this channel that Rick hooked me up with. So thanks for that, Rick. Oh, you had, that's right, you had Bean on, didn't you? How'd that go? Uh, the fans liked it. He's not much of an elaborate storyteller. But I think it was the longest interview anyone's done with him, about an hour and a half. Uh, there's nothing really more than an hour anywhere I could find. So, fans, I suggest you guys check that out. He's also on your uh, your Be Good uh, video that's on your channel, youtube.com slash yep. Rick Bassman. Yep, that's right. It was Butterbean and Sting and, uh, and Lou Ferrigno and a bunch of others. And that brings me to someone else that is on my list of uh, the top 15. That was part of Be Good as well. And that was um, Boss Rutten. Nice. One of the funniest, most charismatic, most intelligent, and nicest people you could ever meet as far as being a true friend. I mean, what what can you say about Boss? Wow. Um, we're, uh, we talk every week on the phone now, me and Boss. and uh, Malibu, Darren McBee, and a couple other people. It's a really nice group. And it's just about, you know, talking and being friends and being supportive and being open and, you know, discussing the world and solving our challenges. And, um, you know, he and I have, uh, we're fast friends at the, yep, Boss Rudin is a gentleman. Absolutely. Um, when he's not knocking you out in a street fight in Amsterdam, Holland. No, that's way, way in his past. He's not like that anymore. <laughs> and even when he was like that, he was a great guy. He's always so much fun. But, um, yeah, we've adventured a lot together uh, across the globe, actually, in at least three continents right offhand I can think of. And, yeah, just truly, truly one of the good guys. So 
Boss, uh, Boss Rutten is right up there on that list too. And you also looked me up with an interview with Boss for another That's shameless right. plug. And that was probably my favorite interview so far this year, just because I have so much respect for him. And he was so friendly and accommodating. And he was on time. I love it how the big stars actually are on time and keep their word. Where when you see some of these lower guys that never quite make it, maybe this all has to do with why they didn't quite get their push and it's not some of these other excuses. No, I was gonna say, man, to be to be a star of any real stature, that that's part of it, man. You have you gotta be on your game. And I, I absolutely 100% support what you just said there. If they are successful as a personality, a celebrity, they're usually pretty dialed. That's uh, part of the territory. Um, I don't want to get too bogged down here real quickly. So I can just like list off the rest of the people and you can tell me if you want to, you know, stop and talk about them. If we get any questions about them, um, we can stop and take those, of course. Uh, others are, um, I don't know if you want to type out the graphic or not. Um, Sylvester Turkai. You- yes, no Sylvester Turkai very, very well. He is a, uh, well, not personally, but as far as just a pro wrestler, he's definitely uh, one of those guys that kind of under the radar, underrated, also known as the Predator. In Japan, he became a star as the Predator. That's where he finally had a chance to become a star. Um, he never got over um, in North America, which is a shame yep. because he, he should have been a big star. Um, he also he, he arguably, and Boss Rutten would support this, by the way, arguably at one time could have been the top guy in the world in mixed martial arts. Um, he pursued it a little bit late in his career. He wanted to try wrestling first, and he did for years. By the time he got to MMA, I think he ended up three and one. And he lost a fight to Gary Goodridge, who ne- which he never, ever should have lost. And it kind of sunk his career overnight, unfortunately. But a- apart from all that, um, probably the the straightest living guy that I know, not only in wrestling and fighting, but maybe if I, that I know, period. And honorable and honest as a day as long. And a God-fearing Christian and just solid, solid guy. So. Sylvester Turkai is absolutely on my list. Um, I found this picture of Nobbs, by the way. <laughs> what? Recently after Patterson's death. Come <laughs> on, you got you spread that picture out. Obviously, it's widened. <laughs> I hate Nobbs. I think he's an asshole that like constantly sucks you for every bit of money that he can get out of you. But if you like him, God bless you. But well, you know, Nobbs is one of those five or six guys that I almost got in fights with, like Orndorff, like the Ultimate Warrior, um, that we ended up not getting in a fight, and then turn it around and became uh, became friendly. So Varsity Yuppie says Gary Goodridge was a killer. No shame there. No, there was no shame at all. But I can tell you this. Well, here's really quickly what happened was Sylvester in his first MMA fight won by knockout on New Year's Eve in 13 seconds. He knocked out a Brazilian guy named um, Mauricio da Silva, I think was his name. Nobody you would have heard of. And over and so Sylvester had a kickboxing buddy named Harold Diamond who convinced Sylvester that he was now a star kickboxer. So the next fight comes up, and K-1 was ready to push Sylvester to the freaking moon. So they book him against Gary Goodridge. And to me, that was pretty obvious. Here's what, here was the plan. In the, um, what about female talent, Nikki? I'll get to that in a minute, actually. Good question. Um, the second booking is Gary Goodrich. And I could see what K-1 was up to. The Predator goes out there, knocks this guy out standing up in the first fight. Everyone knows he's an NCAA heavyweight wrestling champion, world class. Now he's going to take someone down and stuff him and show that he is an all-around fighter and he's going to be the next big Bob Sapp for K-1. Well, unfortunately, this guy, Harold Diamond, got into Sylvester's ear and convinced him to go out and stand up against Gary Goodrich. And that was not the agreed upon game plan. The game plan was take him down, mount him and finish him. 
Uh, Gary caught Sylvester standing up. Anybody can catch anybody on a given night. Boss Rutten will tell you that. A lot of guys will tell you that, that know what the deal is. And uh, he knocked him out. And I can tell you this. After the fight, Gary Goodridge came up to me and Eddie Millis from the Shark Tank, my, um, my partner and one of my best friends as well. And he said, thank you. And we said, what? He goes, I thought for sure you guys were going to have him take me down and stuff me. And I knew going into that fight, there was nothing I could do about it. <laughs> so that's the Sylvester Gary Goodridge story, unfortunately. Um, K1 got pissed and they pulled his push. That's what happened there, uh, regrettably. But, you know, things happen. Um, so I said I'd go through the list quickly. Uh, and I'm not doing that. In other news, my boys showed me multiple pics of Kenny Omega kissing men. I have never even met Kenny Omega. I know nothing about him, so I'm not going to comment on that one. We can let that one go, right, guys? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was his gimmick. Uh, anyways, he had a tag team called the Golden Lovers where it was a gimmick. We already talked about that. It, oh. It's no secret, I don't think. I mean, John probably knows. I think there was a – a documentary on him being bisexual. So I don't think it's any secret. And we all know lots of people that go both ways in this business. Oh, true enough. True enough. There are four more guys on my list. I'm going to give you a list real quickly. If you want are to we on number top nine top. or number 10, John, because I thought number, this would be number 11. This would be 11. Okay. Damn it. I missed one. <laughs> Who was after <laughs> Sylvester Turkey? There was a uh, butter bee. That was the last one we did. Boss Rutten, you, you missed, I think. Okay. I'll make him number 10 then. So I he mentioned. Would be a terrible uh, secretary. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's all right, man. That's all right. We, we had, uh, I had mentioned to you guys that three of the people on my list had passed, and we've talked about uh, Sean O'Hare and Roddy Piper. The other is uh, Eddie Guerrero. Um, and truly, again, one of the nicest human beings you could ever meet. Um, I knew Eddie in passing for years, and then we both ended up uh, at uh, his uh, nephew. I, wait, I'm all confused on the family relations for the Guerreros, but we ended up at Chavo's wedding together in Orange County, and like just really bonded that day and that night for some reason. And we're pretty good friends. You know, another guy on my list is Steve Regal, and like like Eddie, I, I can't say that Steve and Eddie were like close personal friends, like everybody else on this list was. But there's something about those two guys that always stand out in my mind about just being really, really nice, genuine human beings who battled so many demons, so much personal shit, and always like kept, you know, were always graceful about the entire thing, which was really cool. So I think a lot about Eddie and, and Steve Regal kind of in that, you know, same light together. Steve, we know, is, you know, recovered years ago and is on really solid ground in footing, which I'm so glad to hear about and doing great in his career, better than ever. And uh, so two guys that remind me a lot of each other for similar reasons, yet really couldn't be more different at the same time. Uh, Eddie Guerrero and Steve Regal would be on my list as well. I like this story Steve Regal tells in his book that he was like flying somewhere and randomly woke up in an Alaska jail cell with no recollection of how he got there and he wasn't heading to Alaska. I'm not surprised, man. That shit happens, especially in this wild, <laughs> wild world of our business, huh? Um, here's how we do it on time, Hannibal. Where you look like we're doing good. Yeah, we're at number 11 and you got... We haven't even gone an hour yet. 48 minutes. Okay. Well, I think nope. we just did 12 and 13, but I can't count that high anymore. So who knows? You're at 13. Right 12. Now. Regal was 12. Right. Um, Regal was 12, right, John? Yep. Perfect. Okay. So uh, here's one. I want to see if you guys, you know, there, there are some people that probably should be on this list that I didn't put on there because you probably just wouldn't know who they are. Um so I wanted to keep it a little more in the mainstream. But here's one that might walk that tightrope. Do you guys know who Tony Jones is? Yes. Yes, there's a there's an interview with him I did on this channel from Beyond the Mat. Oh, okay, great. So, I, I mean, I've, well, I know John Paz, we know him. John knows everybody, of course, because he's a, 
I'm not saying you don't, Devin. We just know what a mind for the business John has. It's crazy. terrible, terrible what happened to his daughter. Absolutely heartbreaking what happened to Tony's oh daughter. Oh, my God. His daughter and his mom both within a few years. And we talked a lot during both those periods. I remember, I remember it well. And, uh, you know, Tony and I, w one thing we like to say is we've always been there for each other. Um, Tony came in back when UPW was hot and I started that feud or we started that feud, I should say, against APW. And Tony came in along with uh, Mike Modest, Donovan Morgan, Bison Smith, Vinny Massaro and Roland Alexander and a, and a few Tommy Drake, I think, and a few others. And, you know, Tony and I and Mike Modest to a degree as well. Uh, we were all married at the time. We used to like triple date all the time. I don't know how that happened. We went to Mexico together. We went to Vegas together. And we just became really, really close friends. And I don't talk with Tony often these days, once every three months, once every six months. But man, whenever we connect, it's like, you know, nothing, nothing has changed. The guy will always consider one of the true good guys and gentlemen in the business. Absolutely. So I had to have Tony on that list tonight. And one of the co-stars of Beyond the Mat, like you mentioned, with uh, Mike Modest. They were uh, played a big part in that movie. Yeah, yeah. That was an interesting movie, Beyond the Mat. That was kind of the precursor to the show I did the following year for Discovery. It was not... Uh, not yeah, Jim Cornette forgot about that because apparently you broke kayfabe, but he was in Beyond the Mat, which <laughs> broke kayfabe before you even put your thing out. But Yeah, anyway. well... I just had to throw that out there for facts that he likes to uh, put out his own history. Yes. A lot of people practice revisionist history. What are you going to say? There's, um, you know, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to stop because we're talking only positively tonight. So let, let's move on. Um, I, I want to give you guys, since we're good on time, like that one list I gave you really quickly about relationships that have I'm heartbroken that I'm not on your list. <laughs> well, I, 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 I got to tell, tell you this. I have these other little insert lists where I just want to read the names off real quickly, kind of like the one where I told you about relationships that turn from negative to positive. So here's a quick one about, um, and John Pagliacci is asking about Kurt Angle. Hold, hold that for a second, that thought for a second, if you would, John. Um, Here's the list that kind of went the other way from guys I was really close with and the relationships kind of went upside down and I regret that. And I've reached out to them since, and I hope to, to mend these fences at one point. And I, I think they're all mendable and they will be mended at one point. Um, and that list really quickly, thankfully there's only three guys on it, but that's Ken Shamrock and Nathan Jones and Bob Sapp. And Three guys that were very, very good friends, really close friends at one point. Um, and the relationships fractured to one degree or another. And I hope and uh, and I'm optimistic that they'll come back together at one point. So another insert list there that I wanted to mention. Um, Shamrock has not been pleasant uh, with me. So I don't know. Good luck to you with that guy. He's got a massive ego. Yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, man. You know, all, all you can do is do your best. That's all, you know, and that's funny, Devin, as, as much as as much as people think I'm an asshole or a lot of people think that and as much as I've done to at times deserve that reputation, I, I will tell you this at the end of the day. And this is God's honest truth, even with the Jim Cornettes and the John Cena's ultimate warrior, if you're alive today. I would absolutely be open to repairing every relationship because this will sound like cliche bullshit probably, but that whole, um, that whole saying life's too short. I really believe that I do. And, you know, I think why hold a grudge and why perpetuate bad feelings if there's another way, that's my philosophy for better or for worse. So who is number 14 on the list, Rick? I think, by the way, that you will make up with John Cena one day. And if right, I get yeah. more popular, I will help make that up with you for you. Very good. It's all good. I hope so. I hope so. I wish him the best. I do. Um, be John, pause. One more quick list before I get to um, the others on the, the top 15. And the quick list, just a quick list of other people 
that I really like in pro wrestling that I've had good relationships with, but they just didn't fit in the top 15 tonight. So it doesn't mean anything bad. Real quickly, here's that list in no particular order whatsoever. Uh, Shane McMahon, always love Shane. Triple H, great relationship. Sting, of course, you know. Uh, Jake Roberts. Uh, Nate, Nelson Frazier, Viscera, who rest in peace. Miss Viss, that's for sure. Um, Goldberg, always been a buddy. Uh, Masters and Miz, two guys I started. Really, really good guys. Um, Dave Marquez from United Wrestling. I love Dave. Uh, Todd Kennelly. You know Todd, obviously. Um, Todd's a guy that probably should be in my top 15. He's absolutely one of my favorite people on this planet. But again, there's 15 on the list, and maybe the name recognition wouldn't be there. But whatever. Todd Kennelly is on there. Sean Stasiak is on there. Um, Terry Runnels. I love Terry. Uh, Kurt Angle, who John Pagliacci mentioned a moment ago. Christopher Daniels. And then the last two I have on this list, last, last but not least, are John Paz and Devin Nicholson. So there you go, Devin. You made a list. Well, wasn't one of the bad ones. Thanks for blowing my uh, heel cover. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, dude. We're telling it like it is tonight, you know? Has, has and, Terry uh, Reynolds come up to visit you yet? Because uh, we discussed it uh, before, and then even when I interviewed her, she mentioned it might happen. Yeah, you know what? I haven't – Terry and I haven't been in touch in a while. But, hey, word kind of travels from the Hannibal TV. So, Terry Reynolds, as you know, we're here on Maui, me and my beautiful pups, and – you are welcome and encouraged to come hang with us at any time, please. So there you go. All right. So I think we're at number 14 now. Am I correct, John? Yes, sir. Number 14. Without any I don't further ado. I've lost. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the wild man, Luke Gallows. Um, God. Completely wild man, but huge heart incredibly smart, intelligent guy. I met him late in my career in pro wrestling. Um, we hit it off immediately and we ended up doing some bizarre adventures together, man. We went, me and Luke and Nathan Jones went to the democratic Republic of the freaking Congo together. Um, which at the time was on the United States. Do not visit list. It was gnarly. And we um, had a hell of an adventure. Talk about a triple date. Me, Nathan, and Luke, and uh, three young ladies we met in the Congo. That was fun. Um, we uh, had a great um, adventure together in Guyana. We did a couple of shows out there with Goldberg and Viss and Paul London and a bunch of other guys, Tom Howard, other guys that I mentioned tonight. Um, we went to uh, – Luke and I went as the pro wrestling spokespeople to the um, – African Advocates for AIDS annual convention. Don't even ask me to explain that one. But um, he was an awesome guy, great sense of humor, great heart, great talent, um, and great brain. So Luke Gallows had to be on that list for sure. Somebody had asked if Bret Hart is on your list. I think it was Paul Grillo. I barely know Bret. Um, it would be kind of similar to my answer earlier tonight for Vader um, I think there was one other, I don't recall who, oh, Ricky Steamboat, that I've met Brett only on a handful of occasions. It's always been pleasant. He seems like a nice enough guy to me, but there's no real relationship there. So I can't say much more than that. Vader was a nice, nice guy to me, though. I will say that when I interviewed him, I had a lot of fun with him. But I could see how if you were doing business with him, he could be difficult on a regular basis. But when I met him, I think he knew he was about to pass away and he was just lonely at that time and happy to have a visitor. Sure. Yep. I, ha I had one good altercation with Vader, one bad one, and then he made it up to me and he did a great interview for me. So it was like, you know, you take the good, take the bad, and then he made up for it. So I'll, I'll say he's definitely a good guy. Awesome interview yeah. too. Uh, Just Josh says, what do you think of Sting's AEW move? You know, I don't really have a lot to say about that. It's kind of off topic for tonight. I know, John, pause. You could talk about that for hours because you're you're expert at these things. Uh, I'll just say this quickly. I think it's great that he's still active and that he's still producing. And, and I would say happy as well. Because I'll tell you one thing about Sting, 
I can tell you a lot of things about Sting, and, and he's a great guy. I mean, I have a really good relationship with Sting and have for decades now. Uh, the one thing is this. He doesn't do anything he doesn't want to do. So if he's at AEW, it, there's a good reason behind it, and it means that it's a good situation for him. So for that, I'm happy. That's really cool. As far as creative and what they're doing with him, I, I don't know any more than anybody else out there. As far as number 15 on your list, the last guy, I don't know if he's technically the nicest guy, but he is the last guy you're going to mention. Who is it? All right. So once again, this, uh, this is not an order. There's no, we know that we made that clear. There's no number one, number eight, number 15, but the last guy I have, is not a guy at all. Somebody asked about female talent. Yeah. Um, and, it's not, and it's not even a girl and keep, and I wasn't counting. It just turned out that I realized this when I made the list, there ended up being 16 and I just couldn't cut anybody out of it. So my last two are my two favorite Melissa's Thunder Rosa. And if she happens to see this, this will probably be a big surprise to her cheerleader, Melissa. And the reason that probably be a surprise, like Thunder Rosa and I, we, I mentioned, I said, hit it off so many times tonight that it's probably becoming old, but we met at a tiny little show in central California. Uh, Billy Blade was running it and hit it off immediately and have been dear friends ever since. And I love, I love Melissa Cervantes, Thunder Rosa. She's just an amazing, amazing person. And I'm so glad for her success these days. She deserves everything she's getting because that girl has worked for it. Oh my God. Um, and you know, she's, she's tough about how she, conducts business, but there's no attitude about it at all. She's, she's great. Um, cheerleader, Melissa, the reason she would probably be surprised to hear that. And I'm almost a little surprised putting her on my list is that she was in UPW. However, God, it was a long time ago, 20 years ago now. And she was really young at 19, 20. She was very quiet. My impression of her was nice girl, emerging talent, you know, maybe she'll do something in the business. Maybe she won't. Uh, her father was a promoter, Doug Anderson. I really liked him. And, you know, I, I kind of regarded her the way I regarded Paul London. Yeah. Hey, glad, glad she's here, whatever. And we stay, you know, we cross paths every now and then, um, but nothing of real note. And we reconnected not long ago and very, very pleasant and positive. And she had told me that, back at that time in UPW that she had felt like, and it was, was not an attitude at all. She explained it to me why she had been overlooked and not been treated right. And I listened to her and I had to agree. She was right. And here she was all these years later, like Paul London, um, no animosity, no negativity, just positive. And I'm like, wow, really, really like this person. And we've spoken a few times since and, each time I speak with her, I, I like her better. She's just great people. So the last two, again, not in order, happen to both be Melissa's in this business, Thunder Rosa and cheerleader Melissa. And I'm putting up her uh, GoFundMe link because, Rick, I don't know if you're aware of this, but she just lost uh, her leg. Oh, that's Melissa oh, Coach. I got that's the a wrong third word. Melissa. I got that's the a wrong third word. Melissa you're talking about. I got the wrong word. Here, you almost gave me a mild heart attack because I'm now picturing Chiller and Melissa or Thunder Rosa without a leg. I should have oh. laughed at this, but no, I had it confused with Melissa Coates. Cheerleader Melissa, of course. Yes. Melissa yes. Coates was also with uh, UPW, by the way. So that's interesting. So, that you, and I know <laughs> Melissa, Coates. Help Melissa Coates out. Here we go. <laughs> um, guys, yeah. Melissa Coates is good people. Um if you can help her on GoFundMe, please do that. That would be really cool. Yeah, cheerleader Melissa is not married to Sabu. No, that's oh. Melissa Coates. Yes. Yes. All right. I think yeah. we have all our Melissa. Melissa single. No, she's married. Oh, is she? Yeah, she's married to a really nice guy who was uh Jason Diedrich. And I I think Jason was a promoter at one point. I know he's in the business one way or another. But yeah, definitely married and living in Vegas together. Yes. I think this space background is uh, screwing around with my head. 
<laughs> maybe, maybe, it, maybe it is. Um, let me give you a, a couple other quick insert lists, if you don't mind, real quickly. Um, I have my list of uh, my favorite people in the mixed martial arts world that um, that I didn't list in the top 15 tonight. Doesn't mean they're not actually there. Uh, Oleg Taktarov, Don Fry, Herb Dean, uh, Gary Goodridge, who we talked about before. I love Gary. Gina Carano, who's a, an amazing human being. Um, the two Marks, Mark Coleman and Mark Kerr, who I manage at the same time when they're the number one and two heavyweights in the world and were absolutely freaking nightmares to deal with back then. And these days are good friends, and uh, I love them both to death. Dan Severn, of course. Uh, Maverick Von Haug, who a lot of people may or may not know but should, one of the true pioneers and OGs of mixed martial arts. And then a guy I mentioned earlier, another OG and one of the top – trainers of history, and my former partner, Eddie Millis, from uh, the Shark Tank. So just wanted to do another quick list there. Nice. Very good. And like we said, uh, there's a lot of nice people in the business and a lot of people you were friends with. DDP, Nova, Tank Abbott, Sean O'Hare, Tom Howard, Rowdy Roddy Piper, Paul London, Butterbean, Boss Rutten, Sylvester Turkai, Eddie Guerrero, Lord Stephen Regal, Tony Jones, Luke Gallows, and then Thunder Rosa slash cheerleader Melissa was the full list. Then you mentioned some other ones that are nice as well. So pretty damn good list and a lot of good friends you had there. Nice and, and some high places. So very, very cool. Yeah, to connect uh, with you know, I've been, I've been lucky in that regard, man. A form, you know, it's funny. It's, it's a weird business to be in, man, especially, you know, as a promoter slash agent, because, you know, like, like Nova, um, when you, Mike Bucci, uh, talent relations at WWE, by sheer virtue of being in that sort of position, you're already going to catch some heat. It just comes with that position if you're not quote unquote one of the boys. But um, you know, I've been I've been very very lucky that I've a been able, despite you know not being one of the boys per se, being able to form like so many good what I think are lifelong friendships with truly great people in this business. So. You know, it absolutely like at the top of the show, Hannibal talked about how I'm probably the most hated person on Hannibal TV right now. And that bums me out a little bit, not too much, because it comes with the territory. And I know that. But the friendships, all the good stuff so far outweighs that, that it makes it well worth it. So that's uh, that's been an absolute blessing for sure. That happens in the business. You know what I mean? You get some uh, haters, if you will. You get some heat, you know, especially with the Warrior fans. And obviously, there's some Paul Ondra fans out there as well. And it wasn't really anything negative. It was just that, you know, maybe there was going to be a fight there. Yeah, the Orndorff thing was nothing negative at all. But I think people, I think people basically thought that I was being ridiculous or putting myself over um, by, by sure virtue of the fact that I stated that, hey, if he wanted to fight, I was going to fight him. Um, I didn't say I would kick his ass, whatever the case would be. Um, but that rubs some people the wrong way. And if it did, you know, tough luck, whatever. Can't please all the people all the time, man. Were you alone in those? Or, like, did you have your usual crew of, of backup there in case you did get in trouble? No, no. That was a dressing room full of people at uh, UWF, one of Herb's shows, where he, Orndorff, probably had more friends than I had. Um, the one thing I didn't tell about the – the near fight with Warrior, and this is going to be, if I want to piss people off again, why not? If I, for everything I hear now, if I had fought Paul Orndorff, everything I hear, I probably would have got my ass handed to me. Um, and I'm not going to dispute that. You know, I, I know his credentials now. I know what he did. I probably would have got my ass kicked. But let's get people to hate me more. If I had fought Warrior, I think I would have beat Warrior. I'm going to go on the record and say that right now. And Whoa. Pe Whoa. people, here's the thing. It's not the first time I've said it. And that's an important distinction to draw. And here's why. I, I read some of the comments on Hannibal. They said, well, it's easy to talk about the dead. He can't defend himself. And, and you're right. You got to, what do you say about when someone's passed, right? But I was telling a story that I've told many times when he was alive as well. So he certainly had the opportunity to answer that if it had been on his radar, it probably was beneath his radar. I can understand why he's a big star. Um, but when the near confrontation with Warrior happened at Gold's Gym in Venice, I did have my backup crew with me at that point, at that particular day. And a lot of people heard the exchange. And I do remember thinking, I'll be really honest about it. I hope I don't sound like too much of a pussy. 
I remember thinking, well, if we fight, there's a chance I beat him. That's going to make him look horrible and make me look good. There's a chance he's going to get the better of me and I'm going to be in trouble. But I do have all my boys here to back me up if that happens. So I neglected to mention that during that first interview. Yeah, and I imagine that myself just from being Facebook friends with you and seeing pictures of that. But also people forget that you knew him when he was a nobody. So you oh, had yeah. a different relationship. They forget that you had a, a long-time relationship and you helped make him a star. Yeah, we, we, like lived in the same, we lived in the same house together. Yeah, I mean, during his first training. Absolutely, yeah. And all friends, like a lot of them, especially aggressive ones that take steroids, will have those type of blow-ups in their yeah. lives. I've seen it a million times. Yeah, so and, I, and I'll say this again, you know, if, if people want to get into how ridiculous I sound right now, I, I, I will say this. Warrior was, I think, legit 6'5". He was huge back, especially back in those days. I'm 5'4". So he's a foot and an inch taller than me. I think he was probably 285. My normal weight was 135. So he got me about 150 pounds. Um, you know, I'm pretty strong for my size. My bet, you see my photos from back then. My best bench at that time was 315, which is pretty heavy for a guy that size. Um, and I, I have that on record because I used to do bench press contests of all sorts of things. Um, but Warrior was probably pushing up 500. Um, I mean, there's no way I was anywhere near as strong as him. He was way bigger than me, way stronger than me. But the guy had no skills, and I knew that, you know, and I did have skills. So, who knows where the equalizer is? Maybe he would have killed me. I don't know. But I I didn't uh, I, I put it this way. I would fight Warrior a hundred times for every time I would fight Charlie Haas. There you go. Right. You knew that Charlie Haas is a guy that's had thousands of amateur wrestling matches and a fight to him is nothing where Warrior yeah. probably hasn't had too many legitimate fights and if, if, no, if any if, if if any ever you know yeah. most, most people haven't you know it's funny i was staying uh a couple of years ago i was staying with uh tyler rex and his wife for a while and you know gabe tough tyler rex has a very successful business called body spartan i want to give him a a push bodyspartan.com if you want to turn your fitness around um and he was having some business challenges with certain people at that point. And you know what Tyler Rex looks like, you know, with the dreads and the body. I mean, great look, jacked up guy, right? He's huge, and, right? Yeah, huge. And there was like a period for like a month in the house where he was getting pissed at a lot of people. And he was going, oh, yeah, I'm going to kick his ass. No, 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 no. Which is so not his personality. He's like one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. So I finally go to him one day. I go, Gabe, you've been talking awfully tough for a while now. I go, I got I to gotta ask you, how many fights have you been in in your life? And he takes this long beat. He goes, none. And that was just awesome, you know? And that's, that's probably true for a lot of people, warrior included. Exactly. People don't think about that. They, they don't. So, Watch a um, – John, John, John Paul, as you're from the East Coast, do you know a movie called Knock Around Guys? Uh, I've heard of it. Is that with um, Guy Ritchie? Vin, uh, Vin Diesel. Um, is Guy Ritchie the director? I don't know if Guy Ritchie directed that. It doesn't feel like a Guy Ritchie movie to me. I could be wrong, though. He, I know Guy Ritchie, of course, Lockstock and um, yeah. and Snap and all that. Yeah, great director. Um, Vin Diesel's a star. So you got to search this tonight before you go to sleep. You'll thank me for it. Search, knock around, guys, fight scene, Vin Diesel. And it is one of my favorite scenes in the history of movies. And it's Vin Diesel in a bar in this little podunk town about to get into a fight with the local tough guy who's all, you know, puffed up until Vin Diesel starts to tell him the story of 500 fights. And he explains in a very calm, almost like menacing, monotonous tone about how 500 fights makes you a legitimate tough guy. And it's one of the great. And then he kicks the shit out of the guy, of course. Um, Got to watch it. And that's true. Experience counts. Nice. I got to check that out. I'm not there yet, but I know I've been attacked over 200 times in my bouncing years. 
Yeah, I'm I'm well over that number from my uh, my private school years when I used to be set upon regularly, and then just being an out of control idiot for years, picking fights all the time. Yeah, experience matters for sure, no doubt about it. Yeah, getting hit in the face and even the balance, uh, like when you're actually put in that situation, especially when you're not expecting it and suddenly you're in a fight with no warning, you can't really prepare for that without experience. With somebody legitimately trying to hurt you. There's no referee there. There's no timekeeper, so on and so forth. Um, yes, it's a, I mean, I'm not I'm – not, I want to back up. I'm not trying to put myself over as some kind of tough guy. We kind of got on the warrior thing, then we digressed. But <laughs> you know, it, it, it is what it is. The warrior, warrior would have kicked my ass, hands down, story over. Yeah, I don't believe – I actually think it would have been uh, interesting to see. <laughs> there you go. Right. Midget versus Giant live. And we saw we saw in the original UFC when there was no weight classes that it didn't matter if you were a bodybuilder. And people always forget that. I would rather fight Nathan Jones, who you mentioned earlier, than a guy George St. Pierre or Charlie Haas's size. Just because those guys are going to blow up faster and they're going to be slow. And as long as you can go a couple minutes with them, you know you're going to break them down. But those little guys, they can go forever if they have the right technique. For sure. Definitely. I think that the Warrior would probably press, slam, Rick, splash, one, two, three, it's over. And I think Rick might be frozen, but this was actually the best stream of Rick's that I've been a part of so far without him uh, getting frozen. But we're wrapping up here anyways. Let's see if he comes back now for the end of it. John, do you have an Ultimate Warrior impression? Um, I just love when he would cut the promos and then you had no idea what the hell he's talking about. And he's like, and then I'm going to be totally insane. <laughs> he, he was a uh, very interesting promo. So Rick, Rick didn't give us his opinion on sting. Unfortunately is really his real deep dive into that, but he wants to remain, I guess, fairly neutral. Yeah. In his comments. I'm surprised Sting didn't make his top 15 list. He always talks so highly of Sting and how he's like the nicest guy. I'm surprised. I think maybe this was more of like a um, shocking good guys, nice guys list maybe. Well, I don't think Rick is coming back, but here's a good question for you, John, to wrap this up. Mm -hmm. What's your top 10 nice guys that you've interviewed? Because I know you've interviewed hundreds of wrestlers by this mm -hmm. time. And yeah, we dealt with the good, the bad, and the ugly. I think I've probably interviewed, I think, 600 or 500, 600 interviews. So it's a lot. Um, I think the nicest is probably, I'd say, Sting is easily one of the nicest. Such a nice guy. Uh, Dusty Rhodes was super, super nice, even beforehand leading into the interview. Hey, you know, hey, uh, Johnny, what do you want to talk about? And like all the stuff, he's cool as hell. Um, shockingly, Tully Blanchard, because you always hear bad stories and bad things about Tully. He's definitely up there on, on my nice guy list. Double uh, A, Arn Anderson, who we've, I've interviewed about three or four times. He's easily uh, on my a nice and guy there's list. there's a popular interview with Arn Anderson that, I, that you gave me to post on this channel yes. that, that people should check out. It took a lot of editing to get <laughs> yeah. the other guys talk out of there. Not but my I fault. That wasn't my fault. That was the other guy's fault. But yes, yes. Guys, 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 guys. But yep. people won't understand that because I cut it out. Yes, thank God. Yes. Um, let's see who else here. Um, King Kong Bundy. Just thought he's such a nice guy and getting to know him personally. That's another probably surprise to people that would think that he's an asshole or not a nice guy. But uh, Bundy is, is definitely up there as one of the nicest guys. Uh, Mick Foley was one of the other uh, really, really super, super nice guys and just easy to deal with and, and just easy to do an interview with. Uh, of course, buddy uh, PJ, just incredible. One of the nicest guys. I know sometimes, you know, he has uh, problems or going through some stuff, but generally just a good hearted, really sweet, nice guy. Uh, Vince Russo, it might be another surprise to shock people, but he is just super nice, uh, super easy to get along with, very, very um, accommodating, super nice. Uh, Jim Ross, good old JR, had him on, I think, five times. He's just super easy, super nice, too. I know people might think he's ornery or might come off uh, a little bit um, harsh or something, but super, super nice. And 
for finally number 10, I know this is going to piss you off, but I got to throw Cornette in there. I've interviewed him five times. He's like easily with me. I know how he is with other people, but he's been so easy, accommodating, friendly to me. Off air, he's been great. Uh, he gave me a collectible that is probably worth five or $600. He just gave it to me for free. Uh, so I've had just nothing but great um, times with uh, Jimmy Cornette. I know other people may have not, but for my personal experience, he's been one of the nicest guys I've dealt with, for sure. Well, I am going to edit that out of my <laughs> version of this. No. But, but uh, I'll only say the nicest guy I ever interviewed is the only guy that actually bought me dinner after an interview, and that is Hillbilly Jim. Wow. Okay. Nice. Yeah, out of the what? I don't, I'm not at your levels, but I've done at least 200 interviews. And uh, from the wrestlers, he just seemed genuine and nice and friendly and not talk to you on the same level and actually bought you dinner. So like you That's can't awesome. get much better than yeah. that. Most wow. of them will say, let's go out for dinner and, and then you expect you to buy it and then order lots of drinks and so forth. But yeah, great old country boy. So people can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at the Hannibal TV or at Devin Hannibal. We're also on Facebook at the Hannibal TV where we're posting lots of videos now right on Facebook, including this one. And John, pause. You can wrap this show up with your plugs, and you can close it up. Hannibal, the death dealer, is leaving for the night to go outside and run in the snow and train like the ultimate warrior would. <sighs> Love it. Thank you, everybody. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. And uh, just really appreciate Hannibal giving us this platform to me and Rick, whose connection obviously is lost. He's out there all the way in Hawaii. So that technically is not the best of connections out there. So thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been the good guys for me, John Paz, and for Rick Bassman signing off. Have a good day, everybody. <laughs>